<laughs> oh, come on. I just tested you. Redirecting. Okay. Looks like uh it looks like we're definitely live on on we, the Zoom. Then. We are live. Come on, I just good. tested you. No, Redirecting. Just do my thing. <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to be um I'm um <clears throat> what am I doing? I'm cutting and pasting and uh but I also am playing your video in the background, although people won't see it until I stop cutting and pasting. So here we go.
<laughs> Quite the video. <laughs> Great. Well, let me get out of here. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my guest today, Liav Sofer. Hi. Hi. <laughs> it's, been, it's been a little while since we saw each other. It has. It really has. But uh, yeah. I've been really enjoying watching all of the work you've been doing to kind of use your platform to promote so many different artists in LA and above and, and beyond. So I've been, I've been watching your work and I just really appreciate you for considering me. Oh, thank you so much. Well, you do so much good in the world. You know, it's just, uh, it's an honor to have you on and to talk to you, you know, to share you with people who are going to come across this. Thank um, you uh let's let's just start by talking about that video great video <laughs> thank you yeah is that a more recent video or just one in the yeah it just released actually uh two weeks ago oh mm -hmm. and um you were making me curious to see what what the what's going on it's on youtube it's doing okay but on a but it went a little bit uh, it, it got beyond our normal fan base on Instagram. We have upwards of 14,000 views on Instagram, which has been great. Wow. Yeah. And then Facebook mm -hmm. got upwards of 3,000. So we are we had a little bit of energy behind that one, which normally as a Jewish cultural glamour rock band, we don't, <laughs> we don't, uh, we fit such a small niche that it takes more time for us to see something really grow in a viral way. But this has been a really successful uh, and fun video for us to, um, I think we reached a, a new community that we haven't before. So that was cool. Probably several new communities. I, I was, while I was watching, I was thinking who, who would be watching and liking it? You know, I think several, several, several different people. I mean, is the, do you feel like, uh, this in the video the music i can see al alone but uh but with the video too is that um appealing to the jewish culture yeah well community? i definitely um have to say it's a uh, you know i think that it's appealing to the jewish culture that we want to be affiliated with <laughs> and uh <laughs> So, I mean, for a little bit of context, you know, Mostly Kosher has been a Jewish cultural group, um, glamour rock, rock opera. We have different people have called us different things for almost 13 years now in Los Angeles. And um, we started as very much focusing on just covering traditional Jewish folk music. Yeah. Um, but as we've grown, we started creating original uh, Jewish folk music that, to our opinion, was still always married to the past and to the roots like we would quote an old folk song or an old klezmer melody um or and then we would write a whole new song around it for example so that song itself actually quotes a line in the chorus from one of the song of psalms that david wrote like the romantic um poems that he wrote back in the biblical days and um, but the interesting thing is there's this one line that's asking, uh, I seek the soul of whom loves mine, like my soulmate. Nafshi is like my soul. Um, and it's interesting line because it doesn't have any gender. It's yeah. just and so we as a um, a band that also is proud of our own queer community that we live in and whatnot when it came to pride month we were originally going to just do a photo shoot because we wanted fresh new pictures and um 
And we had an idea of doing a themed uh, photo shoot that will have some pride energy behind it to, to, to celebrate our queer band members and our solidarity with the larger community. And then we thought, why don't we just film our experience at the photo shoot? We call it a BTS video, but behind the scenes mute video. And as we, so in less than an, two hours, everything you saw was was filmed like the main point was to get this photo shoot but yet the second goal was to just get a lot of footage that later we cropped together to be this music video um that we didn't really intend the music video to maybe be this big viral thing but once we put it out uh we went from where where, where we slowly grow in our followers throughout the years maybe we'll can can grab a brand new 50 to 100 fans a month, depending on how active we are um, or how many shows we do. In two weeks, we have gained over a thousand new followers um, just from this video going out. And I'm researching and and kind of creeping on my, our new fans <laughs> and checking out their profiles. And I'm seeing so many of them are either Jewish or queer or queer Jewish community. And I have literally seen people repost and comment and share and saying, I finally found a, a home in queer Jewish music. And there's people who have been celebrating uh, the fact that we were celebrating along with our incredible colleague and friend, Miss Lavinia Ka, which is our drag queen uh, talent. Um, and that persona is played by Raymond Zachary, and they are uh, incredible. Ooh, sorry. Yeah, Zoom, right? I'll go away in a second. Um, they uh, basically have been an incredible colleague and like a ghost band member and have made appearances with us before. But we said, let's bring you in so we can also, for um, those that feel that they uh, are a little bit weary about what's going on and protecting the drag community and the trans community, we felt it was our obligation to show our allyship and and celebrate those in our community that identify that way so um yeah that was this was a really fun music video to put out and i'm really excited to say it's actually the first of a series of three or four music videos that are lined up for the next uh four months actually so oh, nice. yeah we've been working hard so hopefully we'll be keep building momentum for content which is always a fun challenge for any artist to be coming up with content in this content hungry world. Yeah. Um, you know. Would you say that the um lyrical content uh, like of your uh songs is in the same ballpark as far as meaning and communication, the message? Well, we just put out a recent album of which this song is on called This World Is Yours. And that came out last year, but we've been pushing it and plan to, and all of the music videos coming out, will be celebrating the songs from that album. That album was a work, if COVID didn't happen, it would have been maybe a three-year project and ended up being a six or seven-year project because of COVID. Um, but that was a real pivot from when we were just like our first albums covering y old Yiddish Jewish folk, for those of your viewers that don't know what Yiddish is, Yiddish is the Eastern European Jewish language, which had a lot of its own cultural staples and iconic music. Um, klezmer, if you heard you heard me say that earlier, that's the instrumental music. It sounds very Balkan, Eastern European, Russian, uh, also could be tied with Mediterranean, Turkish vibes as well. Um, and we also identify with the other sects of Judaism, whether or, or diasporatic communities such as Sephardic, which is more Mediterranean and Spanish, or Mizrahi, which is more Eastern, like Persian and, and, and Arabic. Um, so we have a mix of all of this in our, uh, some people have thought of us as a, the pink martini of Jewish cultural music, huh. you know, that group. Yeah. Um, and we, we love them too. So I to, I, we take that as a compliment. But it also means that we're a little bit all over the place. But the theme that we wanted to tie this new album together was mutual understanding. So there's a lot of mental health and social justice themes from song to song. Sometimes we found a piece from our culture that we can really deliver that message. Sometimes we found a quote from just a melody, an instrumental melody that we used as an inspiration for a, a chorus or a hook that, for example, we have a song called Go Away 
which is actually about schizophrenia. Um, but we used an old melody written by a, a clarinetist uh, in this Naftuli Hora that he's a clarinetist that was alive in the early 1900s. And he himself suffered from schizophrenia. But this is one of his favorite uh, melody, uh, most reputable melodies. So we took it, made a whole new song that is an homage to his work, but really is fully full original lyrics. Um, and that's an example of our exploration we've been doing and we're continuing to do. Was uh, was the group always uh, queer based or not? No, and I, I wouldn't even say that we're queer based now. It's more that we just were celebrating the inclusivity of, of that we have of that. For example, I I'm identify on the queer community uh, multiple bandmates that do as well. Um, the rest of them are allies. If you consider, you know, if they're not queer, they're still allied to the community. And it wasn't something that we've ever put out into the world to say, you know, we are a queer Jewish band, yeah. but it was something to say, it, we don't, it doesn't, we don't, we don't have to identify as queer Jewish. We just know that like queer yeah. is okay. Queer is, yeah. is just reality. And it's like, and sometimes this is the first time we've ever um, felt, you know, like there's so much pushback going on in the world that we had to be like, we have to say something. So, so you know, we it's not like anything's changed for us internally, but publicly it was a beautiful thing. We feel like it was a beautiful way to celebrate ourselves and our other and our allies and community to just say, you know, everybody, everybody can celebrate love. And even this passage in the Old Testament is celebrating an expression of love, no matter no matter who your soulmate might be, you know, and that's what was really beautiful to kind of tie that in. Yeah, wow, cool. That's that's kind of uh, dramatic. The whole the whole picture of it. I mean, you may not feel it's dramatic because you've been doing it for thirteen years, <laughs> or you know. But to me, hearing about the depth of it. I mean, I've seen the band. I think didn't the band play at the Saturday Night Jazz series? Yeah, you had us um, right behind Olak. Yeah, which was yeah. Much fun. And I think we might have had one or two of the songs written that we might have performed at the ones from this newer album. And I think we performed a couple because those songs, the eleven songs, have been, you know, projects over the several years that we've brought together. But yeah, yeah. So social justice in general and mutual and, and mutual understanding has always been a part of our lives in this band. I mean, the work I do, which you're aware of, which we might get into is, you know, I do so much outreach work and community work through music to I identify as a community artist first and foremost. And then even my main band partner, who Janice Mountner Markham, who has um, been founded the band with me and, and, and works with me to be my my wingmate in so many of the projects and all of it she also she just got her master's in social justice and human rights like she's very focused on trying to you know bring our world into a more um progressive future so i think it identifies with us a lot as people and so it's going to bleed into our music and the rest of the band has always sat, has always felt aligned with our work and and they're such creatives and, you know, our trombone player who's like comes, he's always in my drummer. They always have such incredible musical technical approaches that they can keep our music sophisticated. And, and, um, and then also our um, bassist, for example, he volunteers in Skid Row with me on a weekly basis and he's been doing it for years as well as other musicians as well. So there's like there's a musical sophistication and integrity we keep trying to bring to the band yeah. as well as servant <laughs> we're constantly mindful of and doing. Yeah. Um, you just reminded me of Kate, you know, but um, who's also musical and works with you um, and actually moved into a more, a higher position over urban, uh, urban voices. Well, let's, let's first of all, switch over to talk about urban voices and uh, so tell us what it is first and then tell us how you how you got into it sure um so urban voices project uh was is a nonprofit that does um, music programming 
uh, in Skid Row and across LA County. So our whole thing is about using music as a way to disrupt and amplify and disrupt the system, but amplify the voices of people experiencing homelessness. We see it as a holistic approach um, to. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, my attention is stuck on dis disrupt the system. What do you mean by that? Yeah, absolutely. We basically have always felt that there's been more dinosaur archaic ways to approach homelessness and that getting people off the streets um, in ways that haven't always left an individual with their dignity or treating them and or humanizing them, but instead um, still really treating a lot of our community as numbers in a system. Um, so we are trying to use the arts as well as there's other partners we work with, but there's so many that see the value of arts humanizing and personalizing homelessness, um, both with the system in general, like the way that arts can be a mental health or therapeutic program that when people are offered services for many times, they have relapse experience when they're um, at the threat of poverty at, and they, they can come back off to the streets even after they've gotten to a program. But when you have a program that's a therapeutic type of arts place, you're not seeing someone as your patient or your client, but you're seeing someone as your fellow artist. And when you're having a group to come together, I mean, there's, first of all, there's nothing wrong with um, programs such as Alcoholic Anonymous, and that's a great program, but you're also, you're coming together with your, um, your brokenness at the forefront of why you're together and why you're bonding. It's trauma bonding of sorts. But when you can bring a bunch of people together with different experiences and you're the reason you're together is for a positive experience, such as celebrating the artistry in each one of us, we're here because we're just wanting to sing together. We happen to also be people that have experienced trauma, experienced poverty. And we also happen to be a program that is there partnering with social services so we can support those that might need. But the first reason we're there is to celebrate the artistry in each one of us, to say, I'm si sitting shoulder to shoulder with another artist in LA, even if they're a beginner artist or if they're a pr prior professional, current professional, you, when you, the minute you see someone as an artist, you see them for different, different level of value than when you see someone as that's a, a homeless person underneath a freeway underpass. Um, so when you either have people sitting in a room together, you even have the caretakers and people that receive the care, humanizing each other, seeing, putting themselves on equal footing, or if you're going and seeing a performance of our performance choir, and you're having a huge audience of people that um, might be from any part of LA or, or, or farther away that are seeing a per group of performers that have experience, lived experience of homelessness, but they're there presenting, you know, mm. art and expression. Again, it just helps to continue humanizing this condition of homelessness and, and continue eliminating the us and them and bridging us together. I always say music's the greatest equalizer. You put someone from wealth and Beverly Hills next to someone impoverished and Skid Row in the same room and you ask them to sing together, you're going to get one united sound. So it's it's truly doesn't see race, gender, you know, expressions of love or socioeconomic class. It, it actually brings everyone together. Yeah. Um, I'm going to interrupt because on that TED Talk that uh, your assistant sent me, um, there's a moment where the group comes out and sings, right? At least one, uh, the first moment that I found. So um, I think it would be great to watch that, can we? Yeah. Okay, so I'm going there. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> um, hold on one second. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and also I should do <laughs> that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Um, let's see. Sorry. <laughs> no worry. It's really, it's really odd that I've, I've forgotten how I do this because <laughs> I don't do it that much anymore, the live. But, uh, oh yeah, I'm looking for, let's see. Where are you? Maybe I moved it. I apparently moved it somewhere else. Um, let's see. Uh, let me find it. 
gonna find yep here it is let's see video to share mm -hmm. okay and doing that <coughs> doing that and okay and um let's see. i know that it's Program it's a ways you. up. Was it relief? There we go. Frustration? And no. Got the strength. I've got, I've got the pain. The and we do it in the music. There we go. Matter of fact, it inspired us to write this song, a song with lyrics based from the, part, the participants of the workshop itself. It goes like this. I'll sing it for you. I've got the patience to inhale, exhale. I've got the energy to sing. I've got the strength to keep on going so I can rise again. Rise. Let's sing it again. I've got the patience to inhale, exhale. I've got the energy to sing. I've got the strength to keep on going so I can rise again. Doobie doobie doo da, doobie doobie doo da. -da. All right, bring it down for me for just a second. I want to ask you guys to do me a favor. Put your hands on your heart and say these words. I've got the patience. To inhale, exhale. I want you to put it in your bodies. I want you to show it to me. To inhale, exhale. I've got the energy to sing. I've got the strength. Say that with strength. I've got the strength to keep on going so I can rise again. Rise again. Ladies and gentlemen, I will help you with the words, but it would mean the most to us if you join us and sing with us. Are you ready? It starts with, I've got the patience. Here we go. I've got the to inhale, exhale, to, I've got the energy to sing. I've got the strength to keep on going. I can rise, so I can rise again. Singing one more time. I've got the patience to inhale, exhale. I've got the energy to sing. I've got the strength to keep on going, so I can rise have the voices and if you're feeling it rise up out of your seats I've got the patience if you're feeling brave won't you rise with us won't you stand right where you are and sing these words with us come on to sing with us I've got the strength to keep on going so I can rise again so I can rise again let's do one more band come on one more I've got the patience I've got to inhale, exhale, I've got the energy to sing, I've got the strength to keep on going. Let's bring it home. So I can last time, bring it home. Rise Singing enough. <laughs>
<laughs> That's cool. That's great. Uh, and uh, yeah, this is a good, uh, great uh, video to watch for you. you. Yeah. Uh, so uh, how did how did this start, actually? Well, um, I was faculty at the Colburn School, which oh. is a conservatory in downtown Los Angeles. Oh. And uh, I was working in the community initiatives department. My uh, supervisor, Dr. Nate Zeisler, um, a visionary himself, was a big support. It was one of my first jobs out of out of finishing my music degrees. And uh, he was such a supportive mentor as well. And in the process of the first couple of years of being there, he uh, teamed up with one of our board members um, who was always asking the question, why are we this flagship elite musical mecca here on Bunker Hill, along with Disney Concert Hall and all of the other music halls, why are we only six blocks away from Skid Row, which is considered an elephant graveyard of humanity here in LA? And why are we not doing anything about it? Um, and he, this board member, was also active with the clinic that was serving the community called the John Wesley Healthcare Clinic, JWCH, um, and or Clinics of Health, Center of Health. And um, he said, if I set up a meeting, um, could you guys do something? And typically, Colburn's community initiative programs were focused on pipeline work for kids that might not have access to the arts. So they're focused on, you know, music education for children and then coming up through until they train the kid to go and audition for Juilliard. That was a lot of the focus of the community work we were doing. So to go and work with adults, um, to go and work in more of a music therapeutic environment rather than a music education approach wasn't a normal thing. But my supervisor went to all of the faculty, anyone interested in this? And I said, I raised my hand. I was just like, I've been looking for something that was more. I, I still felt, even though the music education work was great, I still felt like I was in an environment where we're doing a lot of um, art for art's sake or just seeking of excellence in art as it happens with the classical community. I'm watching all of the conservatory students focused on their audition circuit, focused on you know, trying to get a seat in orchestras across the country and and the, the stress it's putting on the artist and the question of why we're even doing the art sometimes. So um, I uh, I was always an artist that said art, art for the sake of what, you know. Yeah. Um, this was something that excited me because I've always been someone who was interested in community. I did not have experience with homelessness. I did not have an experience with social work but I was so ready to just learn. They paired me up with an outreach worker at the clinic named Christopher Mack. And he was a man who has been working as an outreach worker in Skid Row for, for over a decade. He knew everybody in the community. His nickname was the Urban Sage because he could go into any neighborhood, even if these neighborhoods are feuding with each other, you know, or it seems like they're uh, could be dangerous to others. He was someone who could go in and they'd receive him with a big open hug. Um, and he was also old enough to be my grandfather. And so, <laughs> cause I was only 23. And so basically um, he would laugh cause he's like, listen, you know, you could be my grandkid, but I'll partner with you. If you can bring the music, I'll bring the people. And we had our rehearsal 2014. I just turned 24 and uh, we were in September, the beginning of September, 2014. We had our very first rehearsal. We planned an eight week program in the conference rooms at the clinic because the clinic was located in Skid Row. Um, and Colburn supported my end and Christopher was supported by Wesley. And it was that we called ourselves the Wesley Colburn singers even because we didn't have a name. And he recruited about six to eight people that were willing to try this experiment. And in eight weeks, Wesley had their help, their gala, because they're a nonprofit healthcare provider. It was at this top of a 51st floor in downtown, tuxedos, gowns, full gala style. And our choir, our small choir, I remember we had to go to the YMCA to get proper showers and we had to go to thrift shops to get suits for everybody. And Chris and I were doing it all by ourselves. Um, and uh, when we finished, Unfortunately, the program finished um, for Colburn and Wesley. They they did it as a pilot, but it wasn't aligned with their mission to be continue keep sustaining it. So they were going to end it. And Chris and I looked at each other and we're like, if you show up next week, I'm going to show up next week. And then, so we did. 
And that went on for four more years as we were a grassroots volunteer effort. And by 2018 or 17, we were like, I was teaching two classes on Monday, one class on Wednesday, another class on Friday. I was teaching like four or five classes a week for free. I would finish my job at Colburn and then go to Skid Row and teach a whole, basically a whole nother conservatory program that was completely of a free program where either I was teaching most of it, the choir members in the community kept asking for new classes, a piano class, a music theory class, a sound bath workshop, things like that. And I just kept trying to provide and we would get volunteers. Then we got Kate, Kate, who came on to volunteer, who she was a music therapist, found us at a performance, all the while still performing with the choir. And we were a, not even a nonprofit. We couldn't, people wanted to write a check to support us and I had nowhere to take their money. So once Kate saw what was happening um, and started joining us in 2016, she, um, she was volunteering, she's helping me teach classes. And then she's like, you know, we gotta make this sustainable. And I never felt, Chris and I felt like so overwhelmed that we needed that third person, you know? Yeah. And she came in to bring, start inviting the concept of structure and sustainability. She brought her music therapy, but knowledge to validate the work we're doing. She, she really helped us see the value of what we were doing. Before, I was just grateful that a, a, a building in Skid Row would host us for free, where she was saying, you know that you're providing a service that these nonprofits should be paying you for. You're you know, paying uh, the, to, to have free music classes. This is something that is therapeutic value to the patients of these clinics and things like that. So she was helping us flip the narrative to, to understand the value of what was happening. And that's when um, she, in, along with Dr. Nate Zeisler, some other partners and mentors along the way, um, in, encouraged us to apply for the nonprofit. And the nonprofit literally was Christopher Mack, Kate Richards Geller, and Leof Sofer were the three founding board members. Our signatures were on the, the nonprofit application in 2018. That kind of began uh, the more, um, the, the, the next stage of our future, we started being able to hire employees, fundraise. Now we have a almost a dozen employees. We have programs across the county that it beyond just Skid Row and hopefully growing even more. Um, and the work is starting to feel sustainable. It's starting to be valued by our partners. Healthcare is a big uh, sponsor for these programs. We're starting to see the value in it as um, social determinants of health as part of people's healthcare plans to have arts programs. And this is the big picture goals that we're working towards in LA County. It's amazing. Um, do people reach out to you from other areas of the country or do you get any reach like that? Yeah, there was actually many conversations about, do we want to expand beyond LA and but in urban voices and you know big cities around across the country, but every city's um, homelessness crisis is so different, and um, yeah. it's hard to cut her uh, this kind of program. We have built a curriculum, and we did create a manual for how we facilitate our programs that is very original to us, and we're very proud of. But even then, we still find ourselves recreating it, even if we do a program in Pasadena or Tustin, Orange County, or Venice, you know, we'll, we're already adjusting so much because it's so different just even across the county, let alone a whole nother state. But what we did find, even though when we started, we felt very alone, we, we did not know there was anybody doing similar work. We found later, like four years later, we found that there was a group starting in Atlanta, Georgia, only a year before we started and they were connected to a church. And so they did theirs at a church for many years. There was a group in Chicago, um, Hope, Harmony and Healing, Harmony, Hope and Healing, which I, I'm i just gonna honor for one second, their founder, Marge, um, Marge just actually passed away only a few days ago, um, but she was oh. such a great mentor. She, this woman had been doing it in Chicago for 20 years uh, and many, many years before we even started. And, um, but they just, we just didn't know how to find each other, these different entities that were doing this work. Then Dallas started doing one. And right when, when LA, Dallas, Atlanta, and Chicago, we've kind of found each other. And then we realized this is, the homelessness crisis is growing. So this kind of work needs to respond and grow. So we um, started helping other people 
by inviting them to come and observe our spaces, take the tools they need to maybe build it their own. Like we've hosted our residencies of people from the Santa Fe Corral, for example, in New Mexico or Oregon or San Diego. They came to learn from us and then they started something similar at their homes. And that fills our hearts. Like we're really happy to just be able to let people learn from us. And those groups from across the country, we came together to make a network organization. Um, so we held a couple once a year conferences or every other year for the last seven years. Oh. We're hoping to put one again together soon, but we don't have it announced at the moment. But this was an opportunity for people to come and learn how to do the work or for us to exchange ideas and learn from each other. And that's something that we plan to continue. Do you, uh, I'm sure you do. I, I'm wondering uh, how you um, how you see the the benefits in the homeless community. I mean, besides obviously people coming together and being happy and singing and you know that yeah. in your in your school, your school. Yeah. Uh, so do you see the benefits outside of that? Absolutely. There's there's kind of these questions that people always ask. They say, you know why singing or or is it something that is you know fruitful beyond the hour for first of all when you are in the worst stage of of survival mode you've gone through the emotional spiral either for months weeks months or years of what it took to get you to the place where you're now on the street um you being on the street it's clinically proven that even if you arrive there without any um diagnosis of any mental health issues, you still get PTSD uh, pretty much comes in within five five days. Mm -hmm. So if, if you or I, who felt like we had a clean bill of health, started having to sleep on the streets in, in the city of LA in Skid Row, five days later, we could be clinically diagnosed with mental health, uh, severe to moderate to severe mental health issues. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people think, oh, it's mental health that got them there and all these things. But you know, just being homeless has so many problems. You get preyed upon by the drug dealers. You get criminalized. You have all so many issues that are happening. Your integrity and your dignity is just threatened at every moment and you don't feel human. So when you're in complete total survival mode, many of the executive functions of your brain has turned off. You, you, you're, you're just trying to find your next meal or where you're going to feel safe to sleep that night. Then you walk into a room for an hour where you can let all of that go. I mean, I can't stress enough how important that one hour of therapy is. And if you can understand what we need on a day-to-day -day basis as people who, and I'm speaking to those that have the privilege to not feel that um, they're at the moment, you know, endangered of being houseless, which but there's a lot more of us out there than we realize, of course, that are paycheck to paycheck. But but for any of us that might feel we have the privilege to not have to have that worry, we still need church to find spiritual meaning or sense of purpose and motivation. We still might need therapy. Many of us are in our therapy ourselves. We still are doing some kind of self-care just to keep us functioning on a general basis in LA. Um, so we can't speak light of how important that sanctuary is for one hour for them to have the strength and motivation to wake up the next day and to keep pushing. On top of all of that, we already know how hard it is for us. I mean, I'm horrible at navigating my own health care, navigating a lot of my own when I have to show up for jury duty or the courts or, the, you know, any of the things that we normally have to do on a daily basis. It's 10, it's exponentially harder when you don't have an address, you don't have the motivation, you're dealing with depression and where to get your meal to think about where to apply to get your new ID because all your stuff was stolen isn't the last thing on your mind. But you need that ID to be able to apply for voucher aid housing and that's going to take six months. I don't have to go down the whole spiral. But to, to understand and fathom the discipline it's going to take for any one of us to pull ourselves off the street. We need a little bit of that healing. Now, all of that being said, I consider three levels of homelessness. There's the street level. That's like kind of what I just described. Then there's the, the second level, which is people that have finally got the motivation or the opportunity to get into a temporary housing situation, a shelter or something that might be three week or three months. Um, they moved into something that's not their forever home. They don't yet feel fully comfortable. Maybe there's still a curfew. There's still a lot of supervision, 
but at least they're not sleeping outside anymore. They're getting basic needs met of some food, shower, and, sh and sleep. And so it's very surprising what those three things can do to change your life. Um, though those, those are strong basic needs that can, can motivate an individual, it's still daunting to navigate how to get to the next level of permanent housing. So we found that our program serves that population extremely well. Um, the population that, that are on the streets, we might see them once a month or once every other month, but they're so transition tr um, transitory that we don't always expect that this one hour of sanctuary therapy is going to pull them off the street right away. Um, but it does create a sense of them knowing we're there every week. We see them all of a sudden four weeks later, and then we might start seeing them again in two weeks. And then they start to trust the space and trust the community. And we start to see them on a weekly basis. And this just happened. I just found an individual that came last week who had been coming kind of off and on. And then some weeks he came, you know, a couple of times in a row. He just finally told me he's, he's in line for housing. Um, and that he felt that by always knowing he has this community to come back to every week, it helped pushing him for the next, to, to just push forward. Um, we've also offered to connect people to housing partners as well. We don't do it ourselves, but we partner with the clinics and we partner with other social services. So we, we do sometimes get people who come in, they don't have a connection to a caseworker yet, and then we can get that connected connection going. Um, and we could do it right away because we have caseworkers on site with us every at every rehearsal, for example. Mm -hmm. They might not be in the room, but they're in the office down the hall. So it's like that's mm -hmm. the other beauty of this work. Yeah. But then like the people who are housed now temporarily, they still need that church. They still need that therapy, that self-care to not fall back um, and drop off. So then they get to permanent housing and I still consider permanent housing as a form of lived experience of homelessness because right now, I won't go into the politics of it, but our system, even when someone is now on social security and general welfare that is perm can be quote unquote permanent, disability, et cetera, they're still living in some form of state of poverty and they're still at risk um, in many ways, even if you know that you have a three-year lease with one of the single room occupancy rooms and you know, in the Cecil Hotel in downtown LA, for example, you know, you still can feel at risk. I've had seen members who had been housed for a year and a half, and then they had one mess up on their one of their forms, and they got kicked out of their housing, and they didn't have the security to know that they can be okay, you know. Um, they still had no family or friends to fall back on. And in fact, we've even done emergency funding support for some of our choir members who might have been housed for two years. And then they just because of one mistake, you know, we, we were able to help them out. And, you know, we have some small funds that we can do if they need some rental support or things like that. But um, but basically, it's surprising how even when they get to the permanent housing, they're still in our system very dependent without the, the tools and resources they need to actually escape uh, welfare altogether. Um, so we're also serving that community a lot. Uh, that's a big demographic we serve. So we're serving all three, but the one, but it's the houselessness we don't see that really depend on these kind of wraparound services and arts uh, intervention, therapeutic programming. Yeah, kind of leaves me speechless. Um, are, and thinking thinking of that, just that by itself, are you, do you find yourself surprised by stuff that's happening that comes up still? I mean, I don't want to sound jaded when I say no. Yeah. Um, I don't think you sound jaded. I was just curious because just in what you said, and I'm sure it's just an inch of what you've seen and experienced, you know, it's, there's, it's a lot. So I'm just wondering, are there moments when you're like, well, really? There, okay. I mean, first of all, on one end of things, there's this sadness that you'll never beat where it's like some people, you can't just fix the problem that the, the trauma the ptsd it's not gonna go away and i've had 
members of, of that have come through the choir. I've had a member that has come through the choir, gone into back into housing, got past the this glass ceiling of poverty of welfare, and even was able to break out of welfare into market rate housing and market rate employment, which is extremely hard to do. And you have to be young and you have to, you know, so many people, there's ageism. So to get a, hired for a job, he was lucky. He was on the younger side. Um, he was able to get into um, a work that was, you know, available to his skill set. And even then, uh, he he still had ghosts that haunted him and came back three years, four years later. And, and it, unfortunately, um, he passed away. Uh, and it was so sad to see someone who had so much, had worked so hard to claw him his way out um, of homelessness. And then still had had issues to work through that that stayed with him, and there's people who have not been homeless for 15 years now, and they're still in our program because they still feel like it's a lifeline to them. And I don't mean to say that I I, I don't mean to say that like people should get to this place where they don't need self care anymore or they don't need their lifeline, but there's still people who just because they've been housed now for 15 years doesn't change the fact they still have no family support they still have no you know friend support in that way that the, the choir has become their friend circle by the way like the other artists in the group are now the people they go out to have lunch with or go get a coffee or go to the park which is such the benefit of group music making is you create your 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 safety net again through yes. your I mean, we always know that in any ensemble in, in, in the arts, if you're in dance, if you're in music, it doesn't matter. You, you, you're, you're, if you're acting, your colleagues become your closest friends. It's just the way our, our industry works. Um, and so they're building new safety networks, but, but it is still not surprising to see people who might have really seemed restabilized fall off again. I've seen deaths. I've seen unexpected, um, and then I have also seen people relapse and fall back into homelessness from a place where you never would have thought that would hit them. Um, and then on the other side of things, I've also seen just incredibly ignorant um, ignorant actions, both done by individuals who are just so... Um, bias against people that are experiencing homelessness and don't see them as their fellow neighbor don't see them for the stories that have could have shaped their journey and let them where they are um i've seen also ignorance of even departmental larger organizations uh i see the people fighting uh, for human rights on the political level and then the people who are the the ones who are wanting to just sweep everybody up and put them in either jail cells or uh, put them in refugee camps, you know, a hundred miles away in Lancaster. Let's just put 50,000 of them in Lancaster, you know, and I can go down the trail of why there's problems with all of this or how the balance of how to fix the city without violating human rights. You know, that's the big question too. When are we, when is it someone's own choice to, to go back into our capitalistic system and and start being that contributor to the system again versus when are we forcing it upon them of course is like a big piece of debate politically so i i i have to say like i've seen so many different sides of crisis that most people might be shocked of on either side and i'm i'm ceased to get shocked these days yeah you know what happens is that Christopher Mack told me you can only d just deal with the person in front of you. You can't you can't save the world. You can't save everybody, but you can focus on the person in front of you. Another colleague told me you can only tend your part of the garden, and your part of the garden is however your length of arm reaches. Yeah. And also reminds me that even though I'm fighting for for homelessness rights or whatnot in 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 the margins of my work. Yeah. I have to be just as patient for those that that's not their fight. Their fight might be the environment. Their fight might be animal rights. Their fight might be something else that is just as important and has just as much integrity. Um, so I also myself have to check that I'm not soapboxing everybody <laughs> um, when I when I feel like I'm um, not surprised by people's behaviors, you know, in or outside of our community. Right. That's a I think that's a huge part 
uh, yeah, just um, knowing that each person is doing what is real for them and what they're drawn to and what they're good at too, you know, because it does take a village. And um, uh, to quote that, <laughs> that kind of throwaway line, but it does, it takes all these different people to make the woof and warp of the material, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, so, yeah, but it must be uh, just hearing you say that and knowing my own, you know, spiritual uh, learning and struggles, it must be challenging for you not to be, I don't know, I guess you could call it judgmental or, you know, just to grant people the right to do what they're doing and to work on what they're working on and to know that it all comes together. Well, it's this balance of, as I said, arts for what's sake, right? And as an artist, I always, we all have something to say. Yeah. And some people feel that art in itself is politics. Art in itself is revolution, right? Yeah. And by making a sound, you are in some form expressing expressing change and expressing something that's transitory in some way, right? So respecting each other, mutual understanding of constantly listening um, and in, in not calling people out, but calling people in is definitely one of the paths I've chosen. I also have this strong respect for people who are radically on the left who are there to shake the rapture, rap, raptures and ready to light something on fire to get the attention. And I think maybe there's some fights where that that level of anger is is I wouldn't say the word maybe is fair, but maybe expected and under and can be understood, mm -hmm. um, and empathized. Yeah. Just as much as I see the people who are way on the other side who are feeling polarized by those behaviors, need a more moderate reaching of the hand to try to invite them into the conversations. Um, I also name my white privilege in in that way and you know i might be the person that that's where i fit best is being the person that can reach the hand out um i always uh work so hard to put skid row and the artists there at the forefront um at the same time i know that it's going to always be my job to exercise my power and privilege how i need to to make sure that they get that spotlight of their voice expressed so I work on that as in my art as well. I mean, Mostly Kosher's album is a product of Janice and myself's beliefs and other band members. We literally on stage talking about Jewish cultural music, and then we can turn around and bring up how we need to start having more empathy and sympathy for those with schizophrenia and mental health crisis. You know, at every moment, I definitely feel like my art is expressing my love for community and for those to try to really love their fellow neighbor yeah you're very integrated yeah it's not a, a lot of people can't say that actually it's really a good thing it's great um, it's funny i it's like i'm allergic to singing a normal love song i don't know <laughs> <laughs> like, like I, I, have i written love songs before yeah do i perform them a lot not often like the one, <laughs> the one main love song on urban on um the mostly kosher album not she is one of them but even that we just it's established has a message the other love song is moth and it's and it's about a moth in love with a butterfly. And it comes from a beautiful Yiddish poem that we set to music and then added our own lyrics. But even in the moth attracted the butterfly, I then wrote more lyrics out that actually, if you read into it, is interpreted as, um, some people could see it as the Israeli-Palestine connection because it's very Romeo-Juliet language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the Capulets and the Montagues. Yeah. And how do we, so thus mutual understanding, how do we deal with the love that can never be, which is very universal. But even in the lyrics there, I was speaking to, there's like one line that says, how do we, uh, how do we, how can we hate each other when we eat the same rice and saffron? And that was about all of the countries in the Middle East that eat the same food, have the exact same culture and yet can't make peace with each other. And I will just be frank and I'll just say out loud, I myself dated a Muslim uh, for a while and felt our own families having tension with my Israeli Jewish family and their other, you know, Iranian Muslim families. So there was, there was just stories that came out through both smaller personal 
uh, moments as well as macro, you know, hu humanitarian questions that we wanted to always speak to in our art and my art. Yeah. Um, I want to play a another thing and uh, let's see, I see that you did a uh, tiny desk concert and was this a concert the for tiny tiny desk or was it a, no i i will was an audition I'll, i was an it was a the one of the submission tapes yes right right i'm i'm interested in that do you mind no absolutely and this i mentioned the song go away the yeah. about mental health and this is oh. that okay cool excellent so let me bring that up oh sorry i gotta share the screen there we go. Go away, go away, cause <laughs> I feel you just don't get it in my demons. Don't quite know you yet, but maybe if you held my hand, I'll go away, go away. Won't you leave me and my voices with me? You don't hear what they're saying to me, how they comfort me. We'll go far. That's your eyes and what they're saying to me Lies and cheating all the people around me Is the stain you think I am gonna go away, go away Won't you turn your head away from me Then I might disappear away And not just in your eyes We'll go far your eyes and what they're saying to me lies and cheating all the people around me is a stain you think i am so just go <laughs> yeah man very nice thank you um, um i have a i have a uh, an idea popped into my head um oh before i say that we we have some comments going on but <coughs> one is uh from roland my friend roland askaroons and he said this is such a part of your life. I see how emotional you get speaking about this. And on a lighter note, he's, he loves the Benny Goodman portrait in the background. <laughs> and he clapped a lot. Um, I'm wondering, um, you know, lately I've been, I've been booking um, this place, Kulak's Woodshed in North Hollywood. Oh, the woodshed. That's yeah. like the cozy with a lot of the stuff on the wall space. Yes. I, I think I've been there a long, long time ago, and it's 
Um, for some reason, I'm noticing a lot of fun activity going on. People keep bringing it up. So maybe it's your doing. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> for about seven months, I've been stirring up mostly jazz. And it's such an, it's, it's not your typical venue, you know, mm -hmm. for a number of reasons. One reason is it's a recording, it's a video recording studio, really. Um, so, uh, so people have to pay for it, very small amount, but still they're getting this six camera live edited video. Um, and, um, but anyway, I was wondering um, if maybe we could bring the urban voices over um, or whatever, you know, however the conglomeration that you would want and actually do a fundraiser for you. Um, mm. And I mean, we'd pay Kulaks their, their money to do this. They, they would stream it and um and then they would also video and then you could take the video they, they also do a pro tools session oh, cool. um, but um and the the room holds maybe 50 people but uh it's a really fun room to be in and to create music in but it would bring you into maybe a different area of the city that you've that you haven't gone and and bring some attention over and i think it would be really cool of course my ideas don't always work <laughs> but <laughs> i think it would be cool <laughs> does that uh, sound like something you would do well i'll you know first of all could absolutely could happen um i will say that booking uh performances with the choir um, is actually a form of income for the nonprofit where people um they invite us it could be all sorts there's been you know con healthcare conferences or conferences that have to do with community work or the grand opening of a new you know when hilda solis did the groundbreaking on her new housing complex or things like that where we've been asked to come and sing and perform um to spread our message of course to move the audience we've also done performances that are sometimes just in the arts world as well, but they're trying to, and, and churches and synagogues and things like that, or Martin Luther King Shabbat, you know? <laughs> um, and uh, when we get, when we perform, they uh, typically make a donation towards the organization to help keep the doors open for our weekly programs in Skid Row that are open and free to the public. So uh, we do do some like self, more self-produced projects from time to time, but when we do a self-produced project, I typically hand it over to the choir and I say, do you guys want to put together a committee? You know, here's the budget we can put together. You guys go run with it and you guys get to decide what we're going to do. So it's, there's a little bit of a town. We have these things called town halls that help have, have, have helped us shape our programs. We do them three to four times a year. And the choir members have put together committees to sometimes um, move forward on some of those kind of things when it's a self-produced project. And out of it has come uh, a, a program we do called Coffee House, which is basically a talent show where we raise funds to get eight to 10 weeks of private voice lessons for every choir member, a full hour coaching for to build up their pre preparation for a, a performance, live performance with a live professional band and get video and, and uh, audio recorded. So it's a really great professional development experience for the Skid Row artists. We have the holiday called Home, project came out of this these committees and that was a arts festival around the holidays before christmas and and around the rest of the holidays too and that's been produced and staffed by the choir and again same thing like we hand them a budget and they they work with they make decisions on on how to do it as a community and the next one which is i'm i'm going to make a strong plug for because it's in two weeks um is come on sing festival which is august 27th which for those that are watching we need a lot of volunteers musical volunteers are great because many of the volunteers would be encouraged to sing along or engage or if they play an instrument as well but but we are building um this this whole idea came from the choir uh we every month do a pop-up open mic slash community jam on the sidewalk in skid row it's one of the ways that we do our outreach to reach people that might be on the street level more and it's such a success it's so much fun we set up a couple pop-up tents and a mobile sound system for three hours people sign up to share their own stuff or to sing stuff that we can offer to play along to 
we always have at least me and a drummer, if not a couple more musicians to accompany them, which is great. So it's like, feels like live band karaoke sometimes too. Or we just jam out with group songs and just have everyone sing along and hand out lyric sheets too. We have these cool lyric books, which I'm trying to see if I have one uh, in close nearby, but I don't see one right now, but it's our come on sing lyric book. It's like a little pocket book. Um, this sun next Sunday, August 27th, the week after this Sunday, we are taking what we do usually on once a month and we're ex- taking it times seven. And we're going to seven locations across all downtown, not just Skid Row. And the intention of the Come On Sing Festival is to do these pop-ups, these music activations in every neighborhood in Skid Row and around to not just bridge neighbors together, shoulder to shoulder singing, but neighborhood to neighborhood, help to eliminate the us and them to help bridge the communities together. And Skid Row artists are going to be facilitating, you know, and emceeing these tents and, and, and inviting anybody. So when we're in Little Tokyo, there's going to be the tourists that will be invited to sing along with us uh, in historic court. There'll be the local residents, you know, or commuters, et cetera. We're going to be at the DTLA Proud Festival. Um, we're going to be at Angel City Football League's, uh, the, the BMO Stadium, right before the soccer game to sing, to get the whole crowd singing before they enter the stadium. We're going to be at, uh, you know, arts district brewery and be part of their happy hour. So we're having multiple locations set up across the city, pods of at least trying to get a rhythm section together for each pod, plus a handful of artists, singers. We're going to be a mix of Skid Row artists and LA community artists that come to volunteer. So they'll be playing side by side and literally inviting people up to get on the mic and sing Lean On Me by Bill Withers or something that everybody can just enjoy. Um, and we're doing that for throughout the day. There's some pods starting as early as 1030, some starting as l- later, like 1 or 130. And we're even having a culmination reception at the end of the day for everyone that wants to come at 6. Uh, and that's the big, that whole concept came from the choir. That was their idea to just, they loved those open mic activations in Skid Row. And they they wanted to share it with everybody. And they wanted Skid Row artists to be the ones leading it. And it's so fun because... <laughs> Typically, like other communities are seen as these, look at Bunker Hill with the Disney Concert Hall. It seemed like it's the flagship arts neighborhood of downtown or the arts district. People don't see Skid Row as a cultural arts leader. And this program, the first of its kind, where we are literally coming out of Skid Row to lead a cultural arts event across all of downtown. Um, So it's, we last year we did it the first time, this will be the second year. And uh, we were really excited to do it again and hopefully turn it into something bigger and bigger each year can't wait till karen bass announces next year this is come on los angeles come on sing day is our big (laughs) hope um but yeah august 27th and if for those that are watching you just go to our website urbanvoicesproject.org and right on the home page is a pop-up where you can click to volunteer and sign up to come and check it out we'd love we still need a, a good dozen or two dozen more volunteers that I'm going to be. That's Urban what I'm doing. Voices pro, Ur, Urban, Urban Voices Voices Project. Project. Dot com. Dot org. Dot org. Correct. Um, I apologize to have to step away from the screen for one second. I, I okay. my laptop is dying and my charger is across the room. So I'm just going to drop. All right. I'm going to uh, just uh, go to your your website for a minute and show people. Uh, here's here's Thank their you. website. You and if you her. scroll down to see where it says volunteer with us in red. Yes. You just click on that and uh, that takes you to a Google form and people can volunteer whether they have arts experience or not. You'll get a free Come On Sing t-shirt for your support. Um, you can share if you want to do a short shift of just a three or four hour shift, or if you're available the whole day, if you have special skills, unfortunately, you won't be able to press next on that unless you fill some stuff out, but fine. And um, this right here is where where... that's the schedule of the day. Yeah. So you can see we have a lot of different neighborhoods activated. Yeah. Um, and based some large everything is about getting to a place where there's a lot of human um, pedestrian walkways and plazas where there's already going to be a 
organic crowd. So we're trying to integrate with the people that will already, you know, be there. We'll kind of be a little flash mob energy into some of them. And we want people to stumble upon us in a way, but we're also getting the word out in case people want to come and join one of these sites, even casually, even if you don't want to sign up to volunteer, but you just want to come out, come on out, bring an ax, get ready to jump on the mic. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think of how to share this on my Facebook or whatever. Uh, like, I guess this could, this is like a, um, maybe the, the, uh, you can website and then just this picture or are you Absolutely. on facebook yeah we're we're just about to we're, we just started pushing a bunch of digital flyers so i can also share with you a digital flyer that's easy to repost um, yeah, so, um well let me get a new facebook up here <clears throat> and um go to your your facebook i'm assuming right i would go to urban Vo urban voices project yeah that's the first one right there. Okay. Um, yeah, and if you scroll down, you can reshare um, a cover photo. There's so many things we just launched just this last week with pictures. Um, that one might be a really good one to reshare. That one. Yeah, because uh, it has um, it has information. Mm -hmm. okay. I shared. Thank you. You're welcome. I really appreciate um, it. Yeah. Uh, for those of you watching, you can you could share this too. This would be great um, if you could share. Yeah. And um, thank you for doing that. Oops. Yeah. I wanted to actually go to your site. Um, doo -doo, here we go. And uh, oh, that's yeah. So then the events and you, wow. <laughs> you could do that too, but it would have, you could go down to the 27th, but easiest is also just to click that picture you had on the homepage. Right. I was just looking at other stuff that you have. These are. Oh, so these, these are, are our weekly programs in Skid Row that are uh, free and open to the whole neighborhood. And um, so we have some programs that are, you know, not actually all of them are in uh, Skid Row. We have a Linwood program for a mommy and me music class for uh, families that are at risk or experiencing homelessness as well in partnership with LA Care. That's the one you see on Thursday. The Wednesday, no matter who you are, whether you live in downtown or not, whether you have experience of homelessness or not, that Wednesday class that's at two is such a great place to come together. Um, people always say, I'd like to get involved. And I typically invite you to one of those weekly jams anyways, the Neighborhood Sing program, because sometimes it's nice to meet each other first as artists rather than yeah. come in as a volunteer that's planning to do charitable service. Because mm -hmm. even in that sense, you're kind of still like a coming in as an us and them pretext rather than why don't you come sit in a circle with us, do a jam with us, meet your fellow artists here. And then we'll talk about ways that we can get you involved in volunteering on a more regular basis if you want to be involved once a month or once in a while. Right. So we, we're very much like come to the Neighborhood Sing uh, program if you can to visit us if you're LA based, make a trip on a Wednesday afternoon to visit to, to say hi. And I see you have virtual workshops as well. Yeah, the Neighborhood Sing is hybrid, so it's offered on Zoom as well. And right. one of our family sings is on Zoom and Music Labs are like our, those are like the music theory class or whatnot, excuse me. Um, and that one is on Zoom, but as of September, half of them will be moving to in-person again, like they were before COVID. Um, yeah. Cool. Well, <clears throat> you know, believe it or not, I have been wanting to come over and uh, there's Kate um, and I've been wanting to see the events. I, I should probably just come over like you just said, you know, schedule like a Wednesday and come over. And I think Kate more recently asked me if I wanted maybe wanted to come to one of those. Um, and um, your events always fall on days that I also cannot come. But... I think I will, now that we've had this talk, <laughs> I will schedule a Wednesday and just come over. 
on a that's Wednesday. the thing is we're more accessible than you know 52 weeks a year you have an excuse to come and see us even if you can't make one of our bigger events such as this come on sing festival yeah. i can say we do have a date picked for our holiday event that's going to be december 16th on a saturday oh, we okay. all need volunteers for that um december 16th okay mm -hmm. we're writing that i'm gonna just write that down december yeah it's, it's gonna be during the day holiday so. party yeah, Holiday Called Home is the name of the festival. Uh, holiday, holiday Called Home. Called Home. Mm -hmm. I need volunteers. Okay. I'm, I'm writing that date down in my book. That I could. Also, the fun thing about volunteering is that typically our own Skid Row artists are also rotating in volunteer service as well. Uh -huh. Just because you might be someone from outside of Skid Row, you're still both serving people that are in need as well as serving shoulder to shoulder with other people with lived experience themselves so again it's like everyone coming together to just help everyone it's very a mutual aid kind of environment if that makes sense yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um event oh what time is the event that one will i don't know if our date is the timing is exactly set but typically that goes uh, 11 to 4 it's like a kind of like a daytime okay uh thing and we try to end before the sun goes down so for those that are walking home can feel safe getting home and yeah. uh, it's usually that one is kind of a festival of different stations of arts programming there's a sound baths that happen there's a drum circle that happens and they're scheduled after each other in different spaces and we partner with inner, inner city arts which they have a nice campus of multiple spaces so um so we're serving the Skid Row community, but also volunteers. What we typically love is to invite you to volunteer for two hours and then also in partake in the in the stations just yourself and have fun for two hours. Yeah. Again, constantly encouraging shoulder to shoulder experiences. Right. And families are really it's great to bring your kids to that one, too. We always have crafts for kids at that one. Yeah. So with all this. <laughs> Is there anything else that you do in your life or is this like your the band mostly kosher and urban voices is that that's leov's life is that correct uh there's a couple more things <laughs> there is. yeah um i would say those two are my projects of which i'm very fond of and and um that i definitely spend the most time uh investing in um because they were they were they're both projects I founded, but I'm very very proud to constantly hold um, keep working with Colburn as part time faculty. I've oh, diminished cool. the job down to smaller projects, and but I get to work with such incredible people there. It keeps my skills sharp when it comes to just um, elementary like K through twelve level uh, music education. Um, what I do there is. Uh, a mix of different community engagement programs that I can help direct or music direct, um, as well as I do help to teach an arts and social justice class to the undergrad and graduate kids. I also do some public speaking teaching with um, the high school level kids. And uh, also I have we have partnerships with them where we have interns from Colburn coming to work with Skid Row. So there's a strong connection with Urban Voices in Colburn now, which is great. My mentor, Nate Zeisler is still there and he and I are and um and then also that led me down another path which i'm not doing super frequently but i i am a regular keynote presenter and teaching artist for the los angeles county office of education about social and emotional learning through singing and community music making that in the classroom so six to 12 times a year i'm typically lecturing about to teachers how they can integrate arts and see the benefits of arts in the classroom, even if they themselves don't feel as an artist. So a big part of my uh, lecture, and if that were ever to be a TED talk, it would be that you can sing even if you think you can't sing. And and if you can talk, you can sing kind of mantras, but of which we know very well, you and I, but um, to be able to, to find some activities and find some examples that really help convince someone. I always say things like, you know, if you imagine yourself as a four-year-old, did you ever think you couldn't sing or did you ever think you had a bad voice when you were four years old? 
<laughs> and so what happened that what what was the learned, what was the learned culture that that stopped you from singing and yep. and typically it's the people who were told they have a bad voice or a bad ear that felt less encouraged to keep practicing the muscle and so by the time they got to even older elementary years or middle school years they already had this huge gap of muscle memory on how to use their vocal cords yep. and match pitch and so at that point this concept of tone deaf which i don't believe in it's really just an atrophy of a muscle that you have never used because something where along the line culturally you were taught that you should that you're bad at it. Yeah. So I have to do a lot of breaking habits for teacher elementary school teachers who don't feel confident in their own artistry and how to introduce arts and and I do the same in other places too. I'm very active in the Jewish music community world and so I'm a lot in the synagogue circuit for um you know, services as well. But even then, it's still, I still try to integrate this into that world as well. I I teach for, teach other song leaders in the Jewish community world, some of these techniques as well, and um, other church song leaders. So, so I have to say, like, as a performing musician, I gig a little bit freelance. I do this uh, music education, social and emotional learning a lot, both in music education, like environments, as well as like, religious music environments, I guess, as well. So right. that probably makes up like the fourth Colburn. And then that makes up the third and fourth bucket of my life. Yeah. Bucket. That's good. I like that. Um, yeah. I, uh, let's see. I, I, th I admire Colburn. I think it's a really, the things that have, that I've seen that have come out of it, that I've, that I've gone to see, it's just all, it's uh feels good to me it feels very ethical um you, you must know Mar marlon marlonius yeah yeah. And, yeah yeah and um you know he's another quality guy you know mm -hmm. with quality music putting it out i've been to concerts in the hall there and i mean just who the hall is dedicated to is you know that's a story in itself um, I'm, I forgot his name. What is his name? Zipper. Uh, Zipper. Yeah, Herbert Zipper. Yeah, if any of you listening have a minute. Uh, what is his first name? I'm sorry. Herbert, I think. Herbert. Yeah, I think it is. Herbert Zipper. It's a quite a story um, of a man who was in the camps and survived and then got into other camps and survived that and led people with music um through uh yeah and it's great reminds me of um frankel's book you know um do you know frankel's book mm. uh, yeah i forget the title um can't say at the moment victor frankel uh, let me let me take a look i mean i'm sure you don't have really much time to uh, read but it's it's a it's a pretty famous book. Oh, Man's Search for Meaning. Oh, no, you know I haven't heard of it. Yeah, it's right along those lines, man. It's great. He was in the camps and he it's such a great book because I you would love it actually because he doesn't concentrate on the horrors. Mm. He concentrates on man's um ability to rise up and push through. And, I will absolutely check that out. Yeah, it's really, it's, I, it's a really great book. It's, you know, yeah, I really appreciated that book. Um, <clears throat> so, um, let's see. I, I'm curious. Did you, did you grow up in Israel or here? Grew up here. My um, father is Israeli. My mom lived there for almost twenty years. Met him there. Uh, my oldest brother was born there, and then um, they came here just right before my second brother was born, and then I was born only a, a, two, two years later. So by just a few years, I could have been Israeli born, but um, I do, my first language was Hebrew, growing up in Fullerton, but like as a toddler, I didn't speak a word of English, um, and it's so funny because I finally went to preschool when I was three, and I came home crying, and my parents were like, what's wrong? And I was like, nobody understands me. I can't understand anybody. And my parents were like, oh my God, we forgot to speak English to the kid. And so, um, 
they switched and they started speaking English to me. And <laughs> and then, unfortunately, I feel like now in retrospect, we we all agree that they should have never switched. They should have just let me kind of suffer <laughs> because I lost a lot of my Hebrew. And I I unfortunately like now I feel like back to back to a Hebrew <laughs> learner rather than truly being fluent. But the good thing is I still have a close connection to my dad and all of his family. I have a kind of cl- close connection to both my parents. There's both they're both together in, in Orange County and they're big supporters of me. But um and and I and they go back to Israel a lot together and I will go with them once a year when I can to see my huge Israeli family. I mean we I was just there in June and we had a our, we always do a family reunion when I go there and when they go and it was 90 people and it was all family members, cousins and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. So it's a huge family. I'm very connected with them. My Hebrew gets a lot better when I'm there, of course, and I start speaking it a lot more fluently. And um, and it's I, I'm definitely and I have Israeli citizenship, so I definitely really identify as Israeli. I eat Israeli food growing up. I feel Israeli. My parents still speak Hebrew in the house. But um, but yeah, I uh, American born Israeli is who is what I am. Yeah. And uh, were you singing from an early age or I'm sure you were, I can imagine you and I would have been great friends if we were children together because I was just a major handball. Um, <laughs> I think I've calmed down actually, but anyway, uh, so were you a handball when you were growing up? Yeah. Our, our, my term for it in, is these days and my friends use the term goober. <laughs> okay <laughs> whatever you want to call someone is just a big theatrical <laughs> goofball um but um, so I was definitely love to sing I I was more of an instrumentalist I oh. like kind of the, the the journey is interesting first of all my mom is a cantor so she, oh. she was in theater and she did puppetry she did musical theater oh. when she came back to America she got her cantorial degree and in the 90s, she started as one of the first generations of female cantors at the time. Oh. Um, and if you don't, for those that are listening, don't know what a cantor is, it's the Jewish minister of music. But in the Jewish faith, cantors are ordained and they have just as much spiritual um, uh, power yeah, so yeah, yeah. as a rabbi. Um, so they're on equal footing as normal senior clergy. So the cantor was a big step for her to move into that direction, but she loved to sing and she plays some piano and, and viol and uh, uh, guitar. And so I grew up in the synagogue going with her to work and hearing her sing. And that's why I, you know, grew up with these Jewish melodies and it really informed my uh, organic synergy with like Jewish klezmer music and whatnot. Um, but then uh, for myself, I quit piano and I, after one year when I was six, I hated it. And I, didn't sing. And I, I like to improvise on piano by myself for the next few years, just for fun. And my mom had books of piano that I would read and I'd play horribly, but I was so impatient. I never wanted to learn a piece. I just wanted to read it once and then move to the next piece. But when you do that for six years, by the time I was 11, 12, I was a much better sight reader than any other kid that took six years of piano lessons. And even though my technique, my hand and scales was horrible, I was sight reading high school level things or piano books. I could open up a full Vian- vocal piano score for like musical theater and be read. I remember I just not, not beginner piano, like advanced piano. And at 11 years old, I'm sight reading Phantom of the Opera, the book top down. And um, it just because I was so impatient to learn a song. I never played a song more than once. <laughs> I kept reading music because <laughs> I learned just enough to read when I was six. And then um by the time I was in high school, I was accompanying choirs for work. I was part-time job ah. as a choir accompanist. Oh. I was playing clarinet in the marching band and stuff like that. And um, I didn't start joining choir or singing. The choir director finally recruited me my senior year of high school. Oh. And that's when we discovered that I have a voice. I mean, I knew how to sing on pitch. I, I could sing, but like, that's when it's like, oh, maybe this is the path that I can consider rather than I always thought I'd be a jazz pianist or I thought I would do classical clarinet. Um, and then I went to school for opera and double performance in cl- classical clarinet. And once I finished both of them, I never did either of those either ever again. <laughs> I was go. burnt out <laughs> by clarinet audition circuit. It does not, the orchestral circuit would not appeal to me. I did play clarinet in the <laughs> Klezmer group in plenty, which is fun, but yeah. 
And then opera, I appreciate the classical chops for sure. And that did direct a lot of, that did inform a lot of my choir director uh, path that I've now taken. And also um, I do teach voice and I do teach master classes in my, in the Skid Row setting with my, uh, and, and in most choirs I do, I, I am definitely a voice geek and I like teaching vocal anatomy stuff. And yeah. so I definitely use that degree a lot in my day-to-day -day work. Um, and of course the clarinet is, was invaluable and, and I still played piano to pay my way through college. So I was always those three instruments, um, and professionally gigging on all three of them, usually just depending on the gig. Yeah. Um, Roland wants to know, he says, this is not out of left field. Are you familiar with the music of David Broza? Yeah, of course. A great Israeli singer. Um, and a pop star in Israel. And there's a song that he sings that I covered many times. Um, I forget all the words, but it's a, it's basically a song that's like a love song. It's just a simple love song, but it's like become a love song <laughs> anthem in Israel. Uh oh, it's a love song that you sing. I, I, you know, <laughs> love songs in other languages. I don't feel like I'm so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So um, when you uh, decided to go to Colburn, what were you looking for uh, initially? You know, being a choir accompanist, I think yeah. you probably can imagine and, and you would get that like eventually you pick up a lot from the choir director and sometimes choir directors would have the choir accompanist sub for them and things. So by the time I was a freshman in college, I'd have already been choir accompanying three or four different group choir groups where I've already had to step in as a section leader or sub for the choir director. My sophomore year of college, I was already the choir assistant director for a community choir or two. And I also started a Jewish youth orchestra with my colleague Janice when I was just a sophomore in, in university. So by 19 or 20, I have already had a couple of years of directing um, community choir groups, adult community choir groups where the average age was three times older than me or something like that. And um, but so when I graduated college, despite the fact that I studied opera and I studied clarinet, one of the most useful skills I had was teaching um, teaching choir uh, through the, the paid work I had in high holiday choirs. I was already directing high holiday choirs by the time I was 19. And, and so I remember I would turn 23, I graduated and I was already directing at one of the, the most largest synagogues, one of the largest synagogues of LA, mm -hmm. Temple Emanuel of Beverly Hills. And I was had a, a job that many other music directors were seeking that were twice as older as me, than me, but I just had these these years of just doing it, and um, so I didn't know what I wanted to do exactly when I graduated college. I figured I'd just do music. I was teaching piano lessons. I thought, you know, I'd do that as the during the day and continue gigging and just build my gigging, you know, my freelance musician uh, experience. But then when my voice teachers, Dr. Steve Cronauer, I'm not sure if you know him. I think you do. Yes, I took from him for three years. So Steve had a position at Colburn and he invited me to be his assistant conductor for one of the choirs he was oh. conducting there. And um, he left after a year, but but um, but I stayed to work on some other smaller projects. Like Nate saw me teach <laughs> and, three, and three months after he saw me teach, he started asking me to do some smaller programs here or there. And at the end of the year, Nate was just trying to you utilize me for whatever different skills I had. I was so young that he wanted me to teach the high school program because he felt like it'd be attractive to have a, a 23 year old running their high school program. It felt like it'd give it some, it was to get, to give it some incentive to get the, the kids. It was more of a pop choir. So that's why, you know, he felt like it would be strong. And then I don't know. I just, I kept coming back to him with ideas and I, and he allowed me to be very collaborative and building programs with him and now the programs I've done that I've been doing for basically 10 years have been things I'm just so proud to be a part of every year. And I'm working and I get to work with some of the premier artists like Debbie Devine, who's 
the head of the drama department, but also one of the best theatrical, theatrical directors for family theater in LA, award-winning. She has the 24th Street Theater down by USC. Uh, she's a regular collaborator and mentor for me. And the other programs I do for Colburn are just uh, things that are products of things I got to invest in and build with Nate. Um, so they do feel like my projects in some way. Um, with And uh, yeah, I, I never saw myself... I didn't train in, in music education and yet I'm doing a lot of it. I didn't train in choir directing, but that's a lot of, a lot of my work. And I didn't train in music ethnicology and folk music studies and class, you know, such as what informs the klezmer, but somehow that became a lot of my work. I just said yes to whatever happened and that's, and here's the result. Yeah. Excellent. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to, <laughs> what is this at California Adventure? Oh, um, <laughs> that person might be mentioning that um, <laughs> mostly kosher's uh, claim to fame after about eight years, seven years ago. First, we were a regional klezmer band, and we um, we really enjoyed so many Jewish bands play for other Jewish communities. Klezmer bands typically are hired for weddings and bar mitzvahs. They don't typically playing for the non-Jewish community. I was always had a mission to use the Jewish cultural music as a platform to reach larger audiences. One of the other things beyond social justice and mutual understanding, I just had a side goal of like getting Jewish cultural music seen as world music rather than religious, because it is the drinking songs, the, the lullabies, et cetera. And I wanted it to be like, I remember looking at the Spotify playlist of world music and you have mariachi and taiko drumming and all of these cultures just like all, and you have to go down like 207 is the first klezmer song maybe, or even Jewish, even Middle Eastern, like Middle Eastern Jewish song. And I just was like, you know, people get confused. Um, so I spent a lot of energy making our, our concerts really reach across the, the bridge to non-Jews, to feel invited, to do a l'chaim with us, dance a hora and enjoy it. Disney Scout was scouting for their very first Hanukkah show they wanted to build. And they decided to scout outside resources rather than build it internally. And they scouted across oh, the country. Oh, I remember this, yeah. And they found us <laughs> and they really liked that part of who we are. We're, <laughs> we're high energy, but we're constantly like, you can enjoy this with us. And it was just naturally how we do what we do. And we, they brought us and they asked if we would produce um, their first Hanukkah musical performance show that's going to be a regular produced show. And it, they've brought in bands before for like a one-off on a Saturday and, you know, maybe the first night of Hanukkah, but they never like produced an ongoing. And I asked, what is that? And they were saying, we want six shows a day, seven days a week for two months, like a full production. Yeah. And they warned me, they said, you know, if, and Susanna Tubert, the director of entertainment at Disneyland Parks, was at my, uh, she was the one that was talking to me about this. And she's been a mentor over there. And she's like, the minute you say yes to this, Liav, Mostly Kosher is no longer Liav. Mostly Kosher is now a brand beyond your face because you can't sing six shows, seven days a week. You have to get other singers looped into the production, rotating bands. That is still the Mostly Kosher show. And, um, I said yes to what could felt could have felt like a big risk to many people who didn't want to compromise the sovereignty of their face as part of a project. But I don't know. I just felt like this is to this is the first opportunity any Jewish cultural band has ever had to be putting to to be making the first impression of the Jewish culture on tens or hundreds of yeah. thousands of tour, tourists from all over the world, not just yeah. the country. <laughs> And it was so successful that after the first year, we franchised the show to Disney World as well. And we were on both coasts at the same time. Wow. And um, we continue at Disney California Adventure now for like, it'll be going into our seventh or eighth year uh, this year. Um, I, it's not publicly announced yet, but I'll just let your viewers know that wow. most, li most likely you're going to see us this <laughs> year again. I guess it was it was <laughs> right around the time that you appeared at O'Lock at the Saturday Night Jazz. I remember because you were you were a little overwhelmed. It was like, whoa, I you know I'm going I'm going for this and yeah. yeah. I don't know, but your Alok show might have even been when one of the Disney producers was scouting us. Mm. Two shows that they sent one of their show directors to come see us before 
committing to us. So I was wondering if the OLOC might have been one of them, because this would have been 2016, I think, was our first year. And I don't know if that was the year we did the OLOC show. It's, yeah, <clears throat> uh, I don't either. 2016, that's like seven years ago. Well, it certainly could have been. Sounds about right. Yeah. <clears throat> so we're very so proud this, this might not be actually you, is that correct? Or it were uh like this i'll show you the screen you might yeah you might see one of our other um singers that's not me uh that one happens to be me <laughs> and that is a that show is you know which one I'll, I'll have you look at which is really fun okay one of my favorite videos if you don't mind you could just type in mostly kosher disney and then um disneyland and then add the word steel um there's like a video, a steal as in like to rob, S-T-E-A-L. I, I can't remember the full name of it, but if if you search that, you'll see, um, did Mostly Kosher just steal uh, Holiday Adventures or something like that? There we go, that first one. There was such a great, one of our best reviews. And in the beginning, in the beginning, he's going to just um, say, he's going to talk for a minute. You can skip ahead. But this was one of the most famous podcasts of um, Disneyland. And they said really? that to, to date, we were one of the strongest shows they've ever had, they've ever seen as a cultural representation. And also uh... they reviewed us as saying this to be the, the strongest and most beloved show of all of the holidays, um, which was such an honor to be a minority because they had like five Christmas acts. And then there's like the one Jewish act. They had a Diwali act, which is a great, I mean, all the acts are great. And then they even, they had a one Kwanzaa act and then the five, you know, Christmas acts. So to be one of the minority acts and to be, um, you know, celebrated by some of the non- Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, let's let's watch a little bit of this. <laughs>
seeing the glass half full, even if it's empty, right? And that's why we sing, to lift our spirits, to celebrate life, right? Yeah. So throw your hands together and clap along as we sing more Yiddish at the top of our lungs. Here we go! It's the Festival of Lights. It's a holiday where you give gifts, you play games, and of course, we eat, right? Yeah. That's right. And you start by lighting the Hanukkah menorah. It's a candelabra, and it signifies a tiny amount of oil that lasted for eight days in our holy temple a long time ago. And those eight lights sitting in windowsills now bring joy and warmth to families all over the world. Like the first of eighty-nine, the farthest candle to the right. Like the first and second two, when tomorrow's day is new. Life three and life four, every dusk light one candle till all eight burn bright and high. back out of here but that i can see why uh why disney would want that it's so joyous and strong and involving you know <clears throat> it's really cool very cool one of our value points of that show is always how can we show our culture as personified joy you know joy personified and and i mean we go into the elements of of some of the sadness at some points very briefly in the Disney show um, in our concert shows, we'll go a little bit deeper into those things as you've heard me discuss, but, um, but even in the full concerts that we do uh, in a performing arts center, even if we have the deeps, the, 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 the lows of the social or, or the strengths of, and the passion of social justice or mental health, I think it's always important to end with that kind of energy that you just went witnessed, we always start and usually end. We always bookend with incredible joy because first of all, Jews are really good at being sad because we're really good at 
turning, making the happy, finding the happy in it. <laughs> it's in the they also find a minor, a minor modality that's doing, that's playing such an upbeat groove, right? Yeah. Um, but also, uh, but I also think that it's just, in the end of the day, a message of hope, you know, that we all need. So keep people. Boy, energized. I mean, you're, you do it so much. You're, you, all your DNA must be like, enjoy. No wonder you have so much, so much uh, energy to do so much, you know, so many positive things. In all seriousness, I mean, joy, 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 joy. I mean, it's great. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, it's amazing. And I can imagine that the audiences really get affected. They get, you know, they're changed by by observing that and being part of it, you know. I would hope so. Yeah. Um, the goal for sure. Yeah. Um, we just have like two minutes left. Do you, is there anything that you want to say that you feel like maybe you didn't mention? Um, I'm just honored to, to, to share a little bit of what I do. I hope that your listeners get intrigued with um, the projects, but of course, to be direct, you know, mostly kosher, please come and see a show. We're going to be in Fullerton at the Muck and Thaler on September 7th, and we'll have other shows throughout the, the season if you follow us. Um, and for Urban Voices, come and sing, come and jam, volunteer. They're, all three are really one and the same. <laughs> and um, and you know, I want. I know your your colleagues are typically a lot of the jazz musician community of LA, and we yeah. we want you guys to know that you should feel really welcome in this in, in this program to make it feel like an extension of your community as LA musicians. That the Skid Row artists are an extension of your LA community, and want you to come and join us when you can. Knowing how hard it is to ask artists to to stretch themselves further in this city, of course, uh, and totally acknowledging that. And then, um, and then, you know, I'll just say my last thing is uh, so much of this came from saying yes to the things in the world and also came from the incredible mentors I've had, like Steve Cronauer, like Nate, you know, Debbie, Kate has been my mentor, Chris Defermack, my co-founder has been my mentor, Janice and my band has been my mentor. Um, and, uh, and they really, and so many more people and my parents. And so I, I really... I'm saying the very typical uh, privileged thing to say. I have to count my blessings, but um, but I do I do have to remember to count them every day. And uh, I hope that um, those people out there that have supported me know that I'm so grateful. And if if they watch this, I hope they hear that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I applaud you, and uh, definitely respect you for all your sight and your action. I mean, Thank you. yeah, I was just discussing that with my husband today, you know, because um, he has a tendency to read the news and, you know, kind of go down that route of telling me, reporting on the negative things that are happening. And I always say to him, you know, you could do something small. You could, mm -hmm. you know, it doesn't have to be huge. It could be just something, you know, a piece, you know, that makes you feel like you're responding. To that yeah you know? <clears throat> so Absolutely. this was a good conversation good and if he needs to figure out what direction that small step is you can always put him in touch with me okay <laughs> maybe yeah. i'll i'll drag him along on the wednesday or whatever the um, yeah, that would be fun yeah. um i i also my friend dan said that will brahm was your guitar player at one point and i i don't know if i knew that but will brahm of course is a great jazz guitarist and very cool he's one of the greats now in my opinion um but yeah. all of the all the band members of mostly kosher have always typically been in my opinion some of the the highest caliber jazz musicians of la huh. uh i uh i have high standards of musicianship even when we're doing folk music i i want it to be delivered with such integrity you know yeah so, yeah and i mean Cecily gardner is is here too and she's she's saying you're such an inspiration and bravo thank you <clears throat> all right well listen have a wonderful day um i'm gonna i'm i uh i have a few weeks of a little busyness but i'm gonna come after that busyness i'm definitely gonna be there december 16th 
Great. I'll be part, I'll be part of that definitely because that's I can actually write it down. You know. <laughs> Plan <for> that. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate this, Kathy, and uh, I hope I see you soon, even even before then. Um, but it sounds like also I should be coming out to one of your shows over at the Woodshack, so the Woodshed. So and actually, let's talk about if Urban Voices wants to come, and we can do a fundraiser. Thank you. Let's definitely yeah. talk about it. Yeah, I think it would be great. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Okay. Thanks, Leov. All righty. Take care. Bye.